Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Q1 FY24 earnings conference call of CoForge Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Vikas Jadav, VP, Investor Relations. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Thank you, Shashi. Uh, good evening to all. Uh, you have received our Q1 FY24 results by now. Uh, they have been already filed in the exchanges and also on the investor section of our website. So I have with me today our CEO, Mr. Sudhir Singh, our Chief Customer Success Officer, Mr. John Spade, and our Deputy CFO, Mr. Saurabh Goel. Uh, Mr. Ajay Kalda, our CFO, was unable to join us today because he is in this post. He is thankfully well on uh, the road to full recovery and we expect him to rejoin work by you know, next week. He shall join us, of course, you know, uh, for the next quarterly call. So we'll begin the call with opening remarks uh, from the management team and post that we'll open the floor for the questions. Uh, with that, now I would like to hand over the call to our CEO, Mr. Sudhir Singh. Over to you, Sudhir. Thank you, Vikas, and a very good afternoon, very good morning, very good evening to all of you across the world, folks. Thank you very much for making time to attend our quarter one investor call. I shall start off by reading from my prepared remarks and uh, shall leave with a quick summary of our performance in quarter one before we get into section wise details. And then, of course, as always, we take questions. So, on with the prepared remarks that I shall read out. Exceptional execution by Team CoForge in a testing environment allowed us to deliver another quarter of sustained, robust, and profitable growth. We have registered a CC growth of 2.7% quarter on quarter and 18.4% year on year in quarter one, the quarter under review. This continued growth follows a performance in the last two quarters where we have recorded sequential CC growth of 3.7% and 4.7% respectively. The growth in Q1 also came on the back of a five-year $300 million TCV deal and yet another five-year $65 million TCV deal in the BFS vertical. During the quarter, we increased our net headcount by a thousand employees exactly to support future growth. We fully rolled out the annual salary increments for all our employees on the 1st of April. We honored all commitments to onboard all campus and lateral hires. We met our commitment to distribute around 21,500 iPads to employees to mark our $1 billion milestone. We paid out in full the annual bonuses of fiscal year 23, and we saw our attrition drop down further to 13.3%. The quarter saw a record quarterly order intake of 531 million US dollars and has set us up very well for meeting our annual revenue guidance of 13 to 16 percent PC growth and the annual adjusted EBITDA guidance of around 18.3 percent adjusted EBITDA. With those opening comments from my prepared remarks, I shall now take you through the quarterly performance and our assessment of the business outlook start with revenue analysis. I'm pleased to report that during the first quarter, Q1 FI24, the firm registered a sequential revenue growth of 2.7% in constant currency terms, 2.8% in US dollar terms, and 2.4% in Indian rupee terms respectively. You will recall the last two quarters we've grown sequentially CC by 3.7% and 4.7%. On a year-on-year -year basis, our revenues grew by 18.4% in CC terms, 13.9% in USD terms, and 21.4% in INR terms. During the quarter, our BFS vertical grew 3.1% quarter-on-quarter in CC terms, and it contributed 31.1% to the revenue. 
The insurance vertical registered a second consecutive quarter of strong growth, and it grew 4.3% Q1Q in CC terms. It contributed 22.6% to the revenue mix. The travel portfolio grew 1.3% QOQ in CC terms and contributed 18.5% to, to the total revenue. The other's vertical portfolio saw growth of 1.8% in CC terms in Q1 and contributed 27.8% to the total revenue mix. Within the regions, America grew by 5.6% sequentially in CC terms. The EMEA region remained flat, and the rest of the world grew by 1% sequentially in CC terms. We saw strong growth across our top customers during the quarter. During the quarter under review, our top five and top 10 customers grew 12.2% and 9% sequentially, respectively. The top five clients contributed 25.1% to revenues while the top 10 contributed 37.7% of revenues. Our resilient performance under an uncertain macro has been underwritten by our continued ability to expand our footprint within our key accounts. During Q1 of I-24, the offshore revenue saw a further pickup and they stood at 51% of the total revenues. Once again, as noted earlier, the shift towards higher offshore revenues over the last two years has been an important structural margin support for the firm. With that, I shall now move on to the margins and operating profits discussion. During the quarter, we delivered an adjusted EBITDA of 43.4 million USD and rupees 3,544 million in INR terms. This reflects an adjusted EBITDA margin of 16% for the quarter. Our gross margin in the quarter has gone up by 30 bips year on year, and our SGNA has increased by 80 bips year on year, reflecting in a 50 bips decrease in adjusted EBITDA YOY. The margin decline quarter on quarter in Q1 is in line with our usual quarterly margin progression through the year, where we see a decline every year in Q1 over Q4, and we see a strong subsequent ramp up thereafter. Basis of performance in Q1 on adjusted EBITDA margins, we remain confident of delivering on our annual margin guidance of around 18.3% adjusted EBITDA for fiscal year 24. The decrease quarter on quarter in adjusted EBITDA in this quarter, Q1, was on account of four key factors. They are, and I'm walking through those, global salary hikes, which were affected from day one of quarter one. It is to be noted that we have taken a conscious call not to defer annual salary hike. It is pertinent also to note that CoForge has dispersed the annual variable pay for all its eligible employees in quarter one with absolutely no cuts. Second, the firm's net headcount has increased by 4.3% during the quarter and it went up by exactly 1,000 employees. This has been done to support our efforts to deliver an annual CC growth of 13 to 16% for the year, which is our current revenue guidance and which we feel confident about. Third factor was an year on a year reduction in the margins for the margins, was on account of hedge gain and losses, which we take in revenue. Adjusting for hedge gains in quarter one fiscal year 23 versus the losses in quarter one fiscal year 24, the impact of hedge loss in the quarter would be around 60 bits. And finally, fourth, we book all our annual visa costs in Q1, and we have done so in this year as well. Lastly, our Q1 consolidated fat adjusted for the dollar one billion milestone celebration cost stood at rupees 1,825 million, which reflected a year-on-year -year increase of 21.9% in INR terms. I shall now move on to the order and take commentary. I'm very pleased to report an all-time high order intake of $531 million during the quarter under review. This was a tough quarter, and yes, this was a record order intake. This is the sixth consecutive quarter where the firm has reported an order intake of more than $300 million USD. An un unimpaired large deal signing velocity based on an exceptional focus on execution has allowed CoForge to deliver continued growth even in a tough demand-constrained quarter like Q1. 
In terms of geographic regions, America has contributed $155 million, India $346 million, and the rest of the world $30 million to the organization. As mentioned earlier in my commentary, we signed a large deal of $300 million TCB with an existing BFS customer. With this signing, we have locked business over the next five years period with a minimum commitment of 60 million USD per annum. Furthermore, another $65 million TCB deal with more than 50% of it representing new business was signed with an existing customer again in the BFS space. The first one that I talked about was a consolidation opportunity that we led discussions around. And the second was a proactive cost takeout deal where we have taken over the wallet from an existing vendor. We believe that signing these two large BFS deals in a challenging environment like Q1 reflects the strength of our capability stack and the execution intensity that marks our culture. Our executable order book, which reflects the total value of locked orders over the next 12 months, stands at US dollar 897 million, almost 900 million dollars, and it is up 19.1 percent year on year. On the people front, at the end of the of the first quarter, our headcount stands at 24,244. Beg your pardon. 24,224, repeating that, and we've seen a net addition of 1,000 people, as I said earlier. Utilization, including trainees, during the quarter stood at 81% compared to 81.5% in quarter four, fiscal year 23. Last 12 month attrition during the quarter stood at 13.3%. Employee attrition at CoForge, and I've said this many times, continues to remain amongst the lowest across the Indian IT services industry. I should now request John Spade, Customer Success Officer, co host to walk us through capability and delivery insights. Over to you, John. Thank you, Sudhir. Today, I'll be focusing just on our AI capabilities. Over the last four years, we've invested significantly in building out our capabilities in areas such as natural language processing, NLP, machine learning, and deep learning. During this time, we've developed and deployed in excess of 100 solutions to more than 40 clients. Solutions in areas such as investment recommendations, fictitious travel bookings, and underwriting decisioning. To make this real, I will talk you through one of our AI implementations. For a leading airline, we implemented graph AI and machine learning to enable a leading airline to capture analytics, highlight inefficiencies, and propose changes that could reduce the gate turnaround times for their airplanes. We believe that as an effective application map today of generative AI using large language models, known as LLMs, such as ChatGPT, can drive exponential value for our customers. As such, we are accelerating our AI strategy to position CodeForge as an AI-first organization. We are embedding AI into all of our service offerings, including BPO, software engineering, product engineering, and quality engineering. Our AI strategy consists of six levers. One, we are leveraging our partnerships with leading US universities working together on AI research and training. Two, we are co-innovating, developing, and monetizing solutions with our customers. A good example was uh, Quasar Ebol, where we actually used AI to automate the end-to-end -end processes for tracking deliberation. And we're going to market with this. We are creating accelerators that allow us to build, train, and implement AI solutions at speed. Four, we are focusing on relationships with the hyperscalers and the low-code, no-code providers, such as Salesforce, Pega, ServiceNow, who we've identified as infusing AI into their platforms. For example, today, we are the first partner to have solutions available on the Azure Marketplace. Five, we are ramping up our training and certification programs. We have a core team today of around 1,000 trained AI specialists across the hyperscalers and the partner platforms. 
we plan to train and set up a thousand more over the next two quarters. Six, we are investing in our AI innovation lab to build out more industry specific use cases. I'll quickly highlight a recent implementation using uh, generative AI. For a US healthcare provider, we have actually integrated GPT large language model for triaging incoming patient requests, then summarize and storing the findings within their electronic health records, or EHRs as they are known. Lastly, we've recently developed a solution using smart glass for insurance clients. It helps property inspectors in the field capture videos and convert to documents, then provide risk scoring related to policy issuance and claims adjudication. I would now like to hand over to Sorob for further details on financials. Thank you, John. Uh, let me now talk about the balance sheet. So cash and bank balances at the end of quarter one stood at $45 million as compared to $73 million uh, previous quarter. And this reduction in cash actually was on account of uh, additional stake that we took over in Coco's BPS, uh, uh, which was 20% at, at, and for which $41 million was paid out. The borrowings in the quarter stood at $110 million as compared to $41 million previous quarter. CapEx during the quarter stood at $8 million, bill debtors at 61 days, and as compared to 72 days, same quarter last year. Unbilled was same at 14 days, which was uh, last quarter it was 12 days, in the current quarter it was 14 days. Uh, OCF stood at negative 20% uh, at $20 million, which actually reflects the total bonus payout that we have done in Q1 and the payout related to the billion dollar celebration. And this is pretty much in line with what we see every year in Q1. For, 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 a fully, um, for the full year perspective, we expect the OCF to be 70% of EBITDA. Uh, with this, I would now like to hand it over to Sudhir for the comments and outlook. Thanks a lot, Sarab. Uh, summing up and outlook, uh, we came into Q1, ladies and gentlemen, you know this, on the back of two very strong quarter growth, with the previous two quarters having seen the firm register a CC growth of 3.7% and quarter four was actually 4.7%. Q1, the quarter under review was a challenging quarter for the industry, but record intake, strong deconversion, continued strong growth in key accounts, an exceptionally committed global team that we continue to invest in, and you've heard about what we've done, and upfront investments that we made with the addition of a thousand more employees to service future growth has set us up well for the remainder of the current year. To conclude, we reiterate our annual revenue growth guidance of 13 to 16% in constant currency terms fiscal year 24. We reiterate our conviction that our gross margin will improve by 50 bits over FI23 in FI24, and we do reiterate that we remain committed to delivering an adjusted EBITDA of around 18.3% in FI24, basis the performance that we've already clocked as a firm in FI23. With that, I conclude my prepared remarks that I just read out, and I look forward to hearing your comments and to addressing your questions. Thank you very, very much for listening. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use hands while asking a question. Participants connected on the video link, please click on the raise hand icon available on the toolbar, or you may click on Q&A icon to raise hand. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We have a first question from the line of Deepesh Mehta from MK Global. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so, they just want to get sense about the 300 million deal which you suggested. If you can provide uh, some more detail about the uh, kind of work and whether any new component into it, because you indicated about consolidation deal. Uh, uh, 
related question is if i look next 12 months order intake it is showing relatively moderate growth despite 60 million acv kind of addition so if you can provide some detail on that uh, second question is about the overall demand environment uh, compared to last quarter when we entered into q1 and uh, now compared to that when we are entering into q2 any change in demand environment uh, either positive or negative or neutral whichever you can provide some color and last question is about the vertical wise if you can provide some sense about underlying demand momentum i understand because of very strong deal intake in bfs obviously near term growth may be strong but if you can provide some sense about underlying demand driver thanks thank you ben um, just noted on the questions you came up with i understand you have four questions uh, the first one specifically the question that you had was around the 300 million dollar deal obviously a very very welcome deal from our perspective as you can imagine this came from a client relationship which started less than 3 years back hence the importance of this deal this is other aspects of the deal that i do want to share with you is of course you know it's in the banking space it ensures that 60 million dollars minimum from this specific client is locked in a lot of what we started with is consolidation of revenue that were already aligned with us or were about to be aligned to us but we plan to use this as a bedrock around which to grow the grow further revenues on a go forward basis it clearly establishes us within this client in that specific country as the preeminent partner for them and hence this is of value to us so 60 million dollars per year over the next 5 years as we see it is a short from a client relationship that started less than 3 years back and this deal also interestingly and finally is not one that is margin diluted it's been done at running margins which again ties back to my assertion around a lot of confidence around delivering on the adjusted ebit guidance for the year the second question that you had was around order executable uh, order executable actually is very strong uh, uh, the page if you look at our numbers at about 897 odd million dollars that's almost 900 million dollars our order executable year on year is 19.1% higher than the same number in the same quarter last year so we feel very very good we feel very solid about order executable the third question that you had was around the demand environment i said this uh, in last quarterly call and i maintained that in an investor conference that we did in mumbai in the middle of the quarter the demand environment continues to be stressed that's one factor cannot be denied the second thing that we think is again as immutable is the fact that we remain confident that we will continue to find avenues for growth to deliver on the annual revenue guidance that we've given so those are the two uh, the two assertions that i will make around the question around demand environment continues to be tough and yet we will deliver on 13 to 16% cc revenue growth per year the fourth question that you had i believe was the bfs vertical specific commentary bfs vertical uh, we continue to see banks struggling with coming up with decisions in the short to medium term given these somewhat uncertain macros and maybe macros that are resolving somewhat but macros that they continue to observe very very clearly and closely for the time being certain segments retail and commercial outside mortgages do seem to be seeing a slight uptick asset wealth management continues to be resilient but overall the sector is still in a wait and watch mode i trust i answered all four of your questions those are the four that i noted down uh, so sure. just one follow up about the next year month order book i was referring to more from quarter on quarter perspective um because 16 million get if added uh, so is it is there any material inter- incremental component part of the acv and i mean if you look at last quarter the page our uh, order executable was 20% higher than the same quarter the same corresponding quarter this year it's 19.1% uh, higher than the same quarter last year our guidance is only 13 to 16% our track record over the last 6 years has been that our order executable growth very closely mirrors the actual revenue that we deliver growth that we deliver in the subsequent 12 months so 19.1% is a number that we feel good about Thanks. Thank you, Rupesh. Thank you. We have a next question from the line of Abhishek Patak from HSBC. Please go ahead. 
Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so uh, my question was, uh, you know, BFS for Cofords has grown by almost 5% last quarter and again, uh, 3% sequentially, uh, despite an industry-wide slowdown. And, you know, we also have uh, pretty healthy deal activity here as well. So are the offerings uh, for Cofords being different as compared to peer? That's number one. And, you know, the other way to look at it is... Um, What's the split for uh, discretionary versus non-discretionary in our portfolio, if, if we may look at it that way? And the second question is, uh, you know, most IT companies have talked about deferrals or discretionary cuts in BFS lines, but the technology spends expensed in the PNL for most large banks the reporting have not seen any such dip. So, I mean, could you help us reconcile uh, these two things and, you know, uh, what's, what's missing here? Thank you. Sure, Avishek, thanks for the questions. The, uh, I'm going to note it down what I believe are three questions. One is uh, BFS, the continued strong growth and the drivers thereof. If you look at us, Abhishek, for seven quarters running before, for us, 5% and 3% sequential growth is actually slow growth. Because if you go back seven quarters before that, we were growing double digit sequentially for seven straight quarters. So the 5 and 3% in relative terms, I suspect, is very solid performance. I, I I would I, I would submit it's not great performance by the yardstick that we hold ourselves to. So we have, like the rest of the industry, slowed down. Of course, we slowed down from a higher base, hence 5 and 3% right now. Uh, the second question that you had was, is there something about our client offerings uh, in the BFS space that sets us apart? I suspect it's less about client offering. It's more around the strategy that we've built over six years. This isn't something that's happened over the last two, four, or six quarters. This firm co-forged materially with roughly about 24, 25,000 consultants across the world, largely focuses on BFS, essentially financial services and travel only. Everyone across the organization, or at least two-thirds of our organization, three-fifths of our organization, whatever country you take, the graduate engineer training all the way to the front-end consultant, they keep moving around the financial services space itself. The client experience, the relationship depth that we have is what allows us not just to sustain volumes, but to actually go and start eating up wallet share at a time like this when consolidation deals are in play. We are stepping out there, we carved out some of them and we keep winning them. That $65 million second deal that I talked about, more than half of that was new revenue for us. It was revenue that we've wrested away from another partner that the bank has. And it's largely come because of the acute focus that we have on BFS across segments, right? It's, it, it's across the full nine yards, asset wealth management, payments, commercial, retail, mortgage. Uh, so that's number two. Number three, uh, your comment, uh, the question was around deferrals and do we seek uh, deferrals? The answer is yes. And as I said, that's why our growth has slowed down to what it has, 3.3%. Uh, and number four, I think your question, if I remember that right, was around expense cuts are not very visible in the uh, in the financial statements of large banks and why is growth slowing down? I wouldn't know the answer to that. We aren't really slowing down too much, uh, and I would hate to hypothesize about it. We feel good about BFS. I said this at the beginning of the year. We said we grow 13 to 16% CC as a firm, and we said that all our three core verticals, BFS, despite the slowdown, travel with the tailwinds, insurance with the resilience that it has and the differentiated offerings we have, all of them will broadly be also, again, evenly balanced in terms of growth and deliver the same. We continue to maintain that. Can I answer your questions? Yes, thanks. Thank you so much. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Anishin. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Rishi Junjunwala from IIFL Institutional Equities. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so, Deep, can you um, you know give some color in terms of the two large deals that you have separately talked about, 300 million and 65 million? Guess uh, you know since it's five years, effectively the ACV is almost 73 million. So, in terms of ramp up and contribution, say to the next 12 months, uh, is the entire 73 million flows through, or these are deals where you know the uh, you know there is a step up every year in terms of revenue accrual? All 73 million is going to be more or less evenly spaced out, Rishi. I mean, there's going to be a little bit of an up and down, but this isn't uh, the kind of construct where we start out very slow and then ramp up over time. 
Out of the 73, 60 million, as I said again at the outset, has been a consolidation deal where a big element of what we've talked about was already with us. So it's not going to be a step jump. The step jump will be from the remaining portion that comes in. But the revenue stream is going to be uniform almost right through over the next five years. We do expect on top of that $60 million revenue stream every year over five years to build a lot more because now we end up being the primary partners for the bank. Understood. So sorry if I, I missed out, but have you called out how much of that 60 was already there versus new scope? No, we haven't. And we don't do that for large deals. But uh, uh, what we did call out was the $65 million, more than half of it was taking over the wallet share of another partner who we were competing with at that specific bank. And a significant chunk of this uh, $300 odd million was revenue that was with us already or was about to be aligned with us already. Understood. The other thing is uh, on the margin trajectory through the course of the year, um, you know, effectively to maintain guidance, you need probably a 400 basis points uh, margin expansion through the next three quarters. Um, so just trying to understand, given that, you know, some of the large deal ramp-ups that you have and the hiring that you have done in that backdrop, uh, what will be the key levers which will drive such a meaningful expansion? I know that, you know, you typically have this kind of a trajectory, uh, you know, on an annual basis, but are there any specific tailwinds that you can call out beyond the normal uh, expansion that you see? We are not expecting to do anything spectacular this year compared to what we've already done in the last two years. If you look at the last two years, quarter one has always been between 16 to 16 and a half percent. Quarter four has been around 19 and a half to 20 and a half percent. That's the natural ramp. It's also a function of how we are set up. We ensure that the full annual increment happens on the 1st of April. We ensure that the full annual visa cost is taken up in quarter one itself. We ensure that all our investments in terms of setting up a bench for future growth is taken uh, at the beginning of the year, which is again something that we've done by doing a net headcount addition of a thousand people in this quarter itself. So hereafter, it's not going to be something that we haven't done operationally repeatedly over the last two years. The ramp will be more or less in line with what we've talked about. Two, two years back in quarter one, if I remember right, our quarter, uh, our margin was 16.1%. That year, we closed the full year with an adjusted EBITDA of 18.7%. This year in quarter one, our adjusted EBITDA is 16%. We plan to follow the same ramp. The guidance we've given is only 183 around 18.3%. So the trajectory is going to be the same. The levers will again continue to be the same. The fact that offshore revenue is going up as strongly as it is. This is, I guess, the ninth or the tenth quarter of offshore revenue expansion. It is again going to be the fact that our pyramid will continue to get flattened out of the 1,000 people that we added this quarter. 200 are graduate engineer trainees, fresh campus hires again. And I said this earlier, we've honored every offer that was there in the market for campus, for lateral, because we feel confident about the growth. So the same ramp as always, nothing new. Quarter one margin also has been more or less in line with what we've done in the last two years. Overall margin for the year will also stay in line this year. Understood. And just last question on travel and transportation. So basically, we have seen uh, some bit of uh, moderation in growth over the past, uh, uh, you know, couple of quarters. More I'm talking about from a YOI and even QOQ, this quarter was slightly soft. Uh, and we have, you know, some of the industry research firms have talked about contracting activity in travel and transportation slowing down. Um, you know, given the kind of exposure that you have, which is more around, say, airlines, airports, and you know, all that, um, uh, can you give some color in terms of how the, uh, you know, the underlying uh, environment, demand environment in that uh, segment is? Sure, uh, when we look at travel, uh, airlines and airports, the demand environment continues to be strong. Those sectors continue to be more supply constrained. When we look at surface logistics and hospitality, we are seeing initial signs of softening. Loving all of this together, we still maintain and we still believe that our travel, transportation, hospitality growth will be more or less in line with the company's growth. This year, all three code verticals should be fairly evenly balanced. Understood. Thank you. All the best. Thank you, Rishi. Thank you. We have a next question from the line of Saurabh Sadwani from Sahasrar Capital. Please go ahead. 
hi uh, thank you for the opportunity i just uh, wanted to understand what are your hiring plans going forward for this fiscal and has the cost really reduced for the talent so basically we have seen attrition go down but also has the cost reduced for skilled talent so so uh, our uh, sir uh, our hiring plans for the year continue to be in line with the growth that we anticipate you can work out the growth numbers to land between 13 to 16% what we need to do is clock a growth number of sequentially somewhere between 2 and a half to 3 and a half percent for the remaining three quarters going forward we continue to hire we already built up a solid bench to provision for the growth that we see especially to service some of the large teams that i was talking about our hiring will continue because we feel confident about uh, the fact that uh, the growth will continue as per the plan that we shared with you as far as cost is concerned uh, yes you're right uh, attrition has fallen gives us more leeway in terms of how we operate so how we operate doesn't change and never will we continue to be employee centric we continue to make increments on time pay bonuses on time honor every commitment that we make to the market on time we have initiated cost containment exercises we finished the first tranche we feel good about the plans that we made to take cost out for the rest of the year and that's also another place where a lot of the confidence around replicating what we've done in terms of margin ramp through the year last year and the year before last comes from okay thank you thank you very much thank you sir thank you thank you we have a next question from the line of vibor singhal from nuama equities please go ahead yeah hi uh, good afternoon sir thanks for taking my question and congrats on a very solid performance uh, once again uh, so uh, so by uh, my uh, basic uh, couple of questions that i have one is of course uh, If you look at the executive order book that we have, it's at around eight ninety-seven million dollars at this point of time. I know you've mentioned it before uh, that this is basically. I mean, we rarely seen any slippages uh, in this. So, given the kind of uncertainty that we are facing at the at the macro level at this point of time, could this very well be assumed as the minimum amount of, uh, let's say, the executive order that we will have in the next coming twelve months? And uh, there is a fair degree of certainty about uh, none of the deals in this part. being put on board or being pushed out uh, in future yeah we were if you look at our record not just over the past few quarters but over the last 6 years the reason right. why our order executable number declared order executable number growth has a very strong correlation with actual revenue that we deliver in the subsequent uh, 12 months is largely okay. because of a how we calculate that order executable right we don't take framework contracts generic contracts and put that into order executable we only look at signed contracts when we aggregate this we believe the almost all despite what is happening in the macro almost all of the signed contracts that we have their integrity will hold it has held in some it's obviously clearly getting augmented over time so we feel confident that we will not see slippages and we have not seen slippages material slippages over the last 6 months here got it that's uh, definitely uh, a lot reassuring uh, uh, my second question we was that on the banking segment uh, i know uh, i think maybe we start before i'm sorry i uh, maybe i uh, probably want to to tell a bit uh, more on this uh, how do i mean uh, for us of course the banking continues to do uh, well uh, in this quarter also and has been quite stable Uh, just wanted to check uh, what is your outlook on the overall banking industry per se not just specific to our clients so our clients are doing good for us but overall do you think there is still a lot of uh, uncertainty or hesitancy and volatility in the banking segment uh, which could impede the overall banking sector spend our sort of clients might continue to do well for us which is a great thing and then as we think that in the result as well so for the overall industry do you see that continuing or uh, or how have you seen that change over the past three months if i could maybe ask that Well, last. If I look at where what we saw a quarter back versus what we see today, I would say things haven't changed materially. Though anecdotally, basis client conversations that I've had as recent as Thursday last week, CIO of a large bank, there do seem to be 
uh, silver linings that seem to be appearing. I talked about it earlier in the call. Uh, retail and commercial outside mortgage spend confidence right. seems to be increasing, especially for next year. So the CIO who I had a conversation with last Thursday seemed far more confident. I'd say far, far more confident than the same gentleman was three months back. I know it's anecdotal. I'm sorry, I can't give you something that's more targeted, but that's how I would characterize uh, the demand and the macros as we see. Got that. Just one last bit on that. Uh, mortgage, you mentioned that outside of mortgage, things are looking still maybe at least some bit of still lining. Uh, mortgage rates, I think last month they reported 6.97. Uh, do you see more pain in the mortgage business for maybe some more time? Well, our mortgage business is A, extremely small, B, in many ways, we think it's bottom down. It, the volumes there crashed and burned last year. So we really don't, can't see a worst case scenario than what exists right now. Anything that happens, we suspect can only be for the good, given what's already happened to mortgage volumes. Got it. I mean, great to hear that. Thank you so much for taking my questions and wish you all the best. Thank you, Vibha. Thank you. A reminder to participants to press star and one to ask a question. For participants joined through the video link, please click on the raise hand icon available on the toolbar, or you may click on Q&A icon to raise hand. You may also post text questions on the Q&A tab. We'll take our next question from the line of Shraddha Agrawal from Asian Market Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, so we have two questions. One is on your insurance vertical. So we've seen two good quarters, two good consecutive quarters in insurance. So what really is driving growth for us in this space? And uh, are there any material differences between demand trends in US and Europe? So these are my two questions. Uh, Shanda, uh, we are seeing uh, strong growth, particularly in the PNC SMB sector of our insurance services business. A lot of it is getting driven by the alliances that we have in this space. Uh, the older ones that we have, like uh, the one with Duck Creek, also the newer ones that we formed, which are doing well for us, like the alliance that we have with Bond Pro in the surety space. So uh, PNC SMB clearly doing well. Some of our partners are pouring outside, aggressively outside North America, and we're traveling along with them on those journeys and picking up new clients and new revenue streams. That again is doing well for us. Our Advantage Go business revenues again have rebounded, uh, and that again is adding to the momentum that we see in insurance. Insurance, I've said this three quarters back, and there were a lot of questions around uh, what is the outlook. We had maintained that the insurance business will grow in tandem with the firm's growth in FI24. Uh, and we'd also said that because of the uncertain macros, it was very important not to bank on any one core vertical, but make sure all three were growing to offset any unexpected issues, which are likely to crop up anytime, anyhow, anywhere in 12 months. So that's, that's how I would characterize insurance. US and Europe at the current point in time, uh, for us, both seem to be doing well. Uh, I've seen a lot of commentary around the fact that demand in the US, US is subdued, but if you look at this quarter numbers, our US, uh, our US geo grew five plus percent. Uh, while Europe was flat, but Europe was flat after some very strong quarters, and Europe is likely to rebound again. So for us, both continue to be happy hunting downstream. Right. And just one last question. I don't know if I missed it, but your balance sheet shows your other borrowings the number has uh, moved up quite a bit. So what is it related to? Sorry, I to take that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Shada, this is related to uh, the additional stake that we have bought in uh, Copo PPS. So, this was an acquisition which was done in 2021. We had only bought 60% stake then. So, $41 million has actually been paid out to buy additional stake in Copo PPS. So, largely that amount. And then uh, in quarter one, typically our bonus payouts uh, happen. And then there are uh, other capital commitments that get uh, paid out. Also. More around that, but large portion gets allocated to corporate PPS. Okay, thanks, Alex. Thanks, That's it for me. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Abhishek Bandari from Nomura. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Sudhir, I just had one question. Uh, you know, you shared a lot of details around your initiatives on AI. Thanks for that. 
but in terms of you know revenues uh, when do you see a material contribution you know coming from you know this particular line of business and also you know in the analyst day you had hinted at you know initially a inflationary kind of scenario possibly in you know voice based bpo bpo in general and also sometimes some somewhere in testing uh, do you still think the the opportunity is going to be on a net basis positive from a revenue perspective i mean happy to hear your thoughts on when do you think we could see real you know contribution from this uh, ai related business for us so i'm saying uh, there's a lot of commentary around uh, ai investments let me just put it this way the line that i see between ai automation analytics is very diffuse right so specifically to call out something and call it out as pure play ai is a little difficult i think it's still early stages for doing it if i were to go back to my leaders and ask them what what is the revenue that they are deriving from ai you would be surprised at how high the number would be because everybody in the automation service line everybody in the ai service line everybody in the uh, uh the analytics service line would raise their hands and talk about even the cloud service line and the product engineering service line would talk about how they're going with an ai first approach so i won't get into the investment piece of it just yet i have been delivered gen ai or cognitive ai based uh, engagements the answers are very clear resounding yes we think the cognitive ai based uh, work that we've been doing has been going on for the last four years gen ai ai there are four projects small projects ai only projects that have been delivered but everything else that you touch when you look at cloud the business that we have around helios the whole thing is ai first when i look at product engineering again there is a very strong injection of ai based technologies the copilot equivalent side is going on as far as the deflationary piece is concerned the second question that you had we believe overall from a company perspective ai should be a growth enabler we feel very very solid about growth on a go forward basis certain aspects will obviously get impacted more we do maintain the bpo industry uh even our own bpo business we keeping a very strong eye out, out for what impact ai interventions can have around processes that we handle testing again continues to be an area where we believe ai based interventions have a way and a possible route to disrupting a lot of revenue streams so we keeping an eye out for it but if you ask me overall how do we feel about ai coming into the space do we see more opportunities than deflationary impact the answer is net we do expect it to be positive but what is the investment i think it's still very premature for us to be calling out now uh, thank you sudeep sudeep my second question in the final question is you know while you have addressed you know you are very confident of this you know 20% uh, growth in 12 months executable order book translating to 13 to 16% growth my question is you know given all this uncertainty what is prevailing you know which is beyond anybody's control you know what kind of stress testing have you done you know amongst your client do you think this 4 to 5% gap what you've kept between your growth of order book to revenue is enough you know to manage those exigencies uh, you know things are evolving fast and you know we have been seeing you know certain guidance cut by some of your larger peers so just you know want to ensure that you know your stress testing is uh, strong enough for you to maintain that 30 to 60% uh, trust me stress testing is about as strong as it can be and our view of the world doesn't come top down from order executable it goes grounds up uh, from projects slash accounts and then we start aggregating it uh, when we look at our numbers last quarter was a 4.7% sequential growth this quarter has been a 2.7% sequential growth when i look at 13 to 16% we really need to do very badly to come anywhere below 13% and i don't think and, and you can see that from the net headcount addition that we've done in the deals that we signed we will come there even at about 2.5% sort of please keep me honest on this even at a 2.5% sequential growth for the next three quarters only 2.5% we will still come to about 14.5% cc growth so we've tested this just about every which way uh, as you can imagine and uh, most years the guidance that we gave is more or less in line with the executable growth this year we are trying to be extremely conservative given the uncertain macros and giving a lower guidance that guidance we maintain and that guidance we will deliver on yeah thank you thank you and all the best for the folia thank you thank you we have a next question from the line of ravi menon from macquery please go ahead 
Hi, thank you for the opportunity. And so you congratulations on good numbers in your uh, top accounts. Uh, I want to check, uh, you know, uh, what's giving you confidence on this guidance? Uh, is it that there are less of, uh, some I'd say, uh, project-based, uh, you know, application maintenance sort of deals that you have where uh, there is a possibility of some of this being seen as discretionary, and the kind of work that you're doing is a lot more, uh, some I'd say, uh, you know, quick ROI. Uh, is that what gives you confidence that clients will continue with these programs? No, I mean, what gives us confidence is a track record over the last six years. This is not a new team. We came together six years back, quarter on quarter as a firm, even through the pandemic, when 30% of our business was in travel, we gave a guidance and we delivered, actually over-delivered on it. So our confidence stems not from the nature of the breakup of the project-based business versus any other cut you can apply. It comes from a grounds-up aggregation of the SOWs that we have signed. It comes from daily conversations that we have with our clients. It comes from the fact that our large deal velocity has continued to be unimpaired. It's actually accelerated even in a quarter like Q1. Uh, and, and it comes from the fact that I think more than to anyone else, we've proven to ourselves that every time there's a consolidation, we come out on the, on the right side of that mix. $300 million was a classic example of it. So we're not, our confidence doesn't stem from forward looking plans. It comes from our past record. It comes from the experiences that we as a team have gone through repeatedly over the last six years and comes from the fact that every time we've given a guidance, we've met it and in almost every case exceeded it. This time we are being, by our standards, very conservative. Our executable is 19.1%. We're giving a guidance only 13 to 16. This year, quarter one, we've done 2.7% after doing 4.7% growth in quarter four. All we need to do is 2.5% to come at the midpoint of our guidance. So, I mean, <laughs> we really can't, having stress tested our numbers, think of any scenario. We will not, we will not deliver on our revenue guidance. That's how I would put it out. Thank you so much. It's very hard for me to hear that. Uh, best of luck. Uh, and one uh, more to just uh, add that, you know, good, good decision uh, to uh, give the wage hikes now. And it looks like the quantum is also uh, normal, right? I mean, you've not really cut back on this, uh, saying that overall, you know, the hiring environment is not great. I'm sorry, Ravi, can you repeat that question once again, please? I yeah, yeah I was just not asking uh, about the, uh, you know, that it looks like the wage uh, quantum, the wage hike seems to be a normal year wage hike uh, rather than, you know, you looking at the demand uh, in the hiring market and, you know, kind of toning it down a little bit uh, compared to normal years. We toned it down, but only a little uh, because the low attrition rate that we have helps us in just about in more ways than just the financial computation, right? The fact that our employees are staying longer with the clients that we assign them to uh, delivers growth for us. So we've just dialed it down a little bit, not very materially. What we have ensured is that we haven't delayed it, which is the point that I made. And what we've also ensured is that we haven't paid only a part of our workforce and not the other parts. So everyone's got it. Not just the increments, but their full annual bonuses with no exceptions. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a next question from the line of Abhishek Shindarkar from Intra Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, am I audible? Yes, you are. Thanks and congrats uh, for a good quarter. I just have one question. Um, the new client addition number has moderated substantially. Now, I know we are signing large deals, but uh, is this a function of uh, more about the environment? Or, uh, you know, is it a, a conscious effort to pursue smaller number of clients, but uh, the large deals uh, within those clients? We, uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, let me make sure I get this right. We've been signing, and sort of feel free to jump in and uh, come up with numbers. We've been signing, if you look at our record, we normally sign about 8 to 11 large clients every quarter. Uh, over the last four to six quarters, ever since John took on his role as the customer success officer, we've talked about very consciously focusing equally on the farming side of the business and making sure that the clients that we sign are only high quality, clients with large wallets where we think we can scale up. 
So a lot of the investments have gone into supporting that strategy. John's team is in play, driving growth on the lines of what I talked about earlier at large accounts, and that strategy has worked for us. Saurabh, would you like to add to that? Yeah, so, and I think a couple of more things what we've uh, strategically changed is that the hunting team has been given asked to actually go after tail accounts, which are long tail was sitting with farmers and not growing. So what we've done is we've asked them to actually focus on those accounts where you already have MSA, wherein you're doing some work, some SOWs are already in place and you're doing some work with them, but those accounts have not grown. So the whole hunting orientation has been to grow these tail accounts, flat accounts, which have not moved. And that's why you see that. And the focus has been only to open the MHAs, which is must have accounts and very specific named accounts, which are called out in the beginning of the year. All the incentives of the hunting team are actually linked to either grow the tail accounts, which are assigned to them in the beginning of the year, or focus on the uh, on the on the must have accounts, which are again listed, agreed in the beginning of the year, so that you have focused hunting strategy rather than trying to open number of locusts. Uh, thanks, that's helpful. So uh, you know where I was coming from is that for the past six seven years, uh, six years or so, we've been having almost 40 accounts a year, 40 to 45. Last year's Q1 number was roughly 12 accounts, uh, new accounts I'm talking of. And, uh, you know, this year we are starting with six. So that is what, you know, I want in the perspective, but really helpful. Thanks, Abhishek. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Ruchi Burde Mukija from Ilara Capital. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, building on uh, earlier question regarding uh, AI. Thank you for the details that you have shared. Uh, here, we just wanted to uh, get your understanding uh, in terms of uh, the timeline. How do you think uh, it will evolve? You expect uh, enterprise adoption on this revenue to start earlier, uh, and the uh, deflationary pressure then, uh, will take some time as the maturity uh, of these AI applications needs to develop before clients start to ask for uh, 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 some concessions from that. John, since you talked about AI in your uh, conversation, would you like to take that and I can there? Uh, yes, could I just have the question repeated? It was not, it was a bit garbled for me. Can you repeat, please? Uh, Ms. Ruchi, can you use your handset, please, and repeat your question? So, um, here uh, I'm trying to understand in terms of a uh, timeline uh, between the revenue incidents versus the deflationary pressure uh, from the AI, how that will unfold. Um, uh, will it be something like this where uh, the revenue incidences start earlier with the uh, enterprise adoption and new use cases being experimented, uh, maybe for uh, clients to ask for concessions because of the uh, AI evolution in coding, the deflationary plays out um, uh, with little slight lag. Is that something to uh, uh, think on these lines or you think both will evolve in tandem? I think it will evolve both in tandem. I, I mean, the thing what we're seeing now with AI is that it's actually becoming an amazing productivity play. And many of our customers, are, and, and, and hence why we're embedding it within all, not just in the solutions, but in the way we work, which will drive that productivity, will actually I mean we can uh, deliver more with, with less. Um, and, and that combined with moving to a much more um, outcome orientated structure, where we're, 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 we're revenue is tied more to actually outcomes and deliverables, uh, we see as a, a positive for us. And let me add on to what uh, John said, Richie. Uh, we expect over the next three to five years, uh, our analytics, analytics service line, our automation service line, our cloud service line to be driving growth for us. And they will be driving this growth because analytics is going with an analytics plus AI approach. Automation is going with an automation plus AI approach. Cloud is going with an AI embedded approach. Next, next, we believe for CoFood, this is going to be a clear positive. Now, if the question is, will AI only as a new service line be a great revenue booster? I think still early to say, 
But will AI plus our existing service lines of analytics, automation, and cloud be a great revenue booster, and therefore will revenue for Cofos go up overall? The answer is a very solid resounding yes. Thank you. Can you ask me a question, Ruchi? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much.